At last, it is back again, the green foliage of the beech trees, the epitome of a forest in spring. There is a great atmosphere in the forest now. Sunlight unfolds its magic, spring awakenings wherever I look. It is May at last. Nature in abundance shows itself from its most beautiful side because everything in the forest is green and blooming. Everywhere I discover ferns of different shape and size. Some shoot up and grow to a height of one meter. Others are small and inconspicuous. Like big candles, the upright flowers of the horse chestnut. Underneath it, very inconspicuous, the greater stitchwort blooms. Yellow colour, dots of the galls shine from the edge of the forest and glades. Lonely and hidden, the little orchid with the pretty name White Heliberine. Inconspicuous but also an orchid, the bird's nest orchid. And of course the pleasant smelling lily of the valley, typical for broad-leaved forests. Most of the plants I can only find with the help of my forest diary. Other places I've known for so long and so well that I can find them on my own. This wild garlic, for instance, also known in some places as wood or broad-leaved garlic, because when the leaves are rubbed, they emit a smell similar to garlic. Not far from here is where the black woodpeckers live but the fresh May foliage of the beech trees prevents me from seeing their nesting hole. By now the young birds should be being fed by both parent birds. While one parent watches the nest, the other seeks appropriate food. A changing of the guard, but first the offspring has to be fed. To my great disappointment, the foxes have moved out of the old fox den that I've known for so many years. But instead, I spot a nest tree of the rare pied flycatcher here in my forest. The female is busying herself with nest building. But before she collects new nesting material, she waits for a moment. She doesn't want to be seen. No one is to find the nest. The male now functions more as a bodyguard. From an elevated position, he can observe everything and, if necessary, defend the nest. The birds that belong to the family of flycatchers like to catch insects in flight, and the forest offers them ample opportunity to do so, because there is no lack of mosquitoes and flies. 
It would be nice if these rare birds could manage to breed successfully. That would be an enrichment of the animal world in my forest. A strange but not unfamiliar smell wafts towards me, which demands my attention. So the foxes that I sought in vain at the old den are living here now. None of the older foxes are here. I'm in luck. If I stay still, maybe the young ones will venture out of the den. This one comes so close that I would like to stroke him, yes, even pick him up, because he's so delightfully clumsy. But then I regain my senses. Of course, wild animals are not pets. While the two siblings play with each other without a care, the other keeps a watch on the surroundings. This little fellow has chosen an old tree root as a toy. With dedication, he is chewing the rotten old wood as if it were something special to eat. What's happened now? As if on command, they all dash back into the den. Surely their returning mother warned them from afar. The song of the black cap draws me to the forest meadow. The young roebuck, not yet a year old, has already freed his antlers from the velvet. His thick winter fur is itching, but he won't get rid of it until the end of the month. His sister is the same age as him. For the siblings, the time of motherly care will come to an end over the next few days. The mother distances herself deliberately. Mid-May, she will bear fawns again. But before that, she separates from her nearly adult offspring. As soon as they come near, the mother flees. This way she signals to both of them that the family has been dissolved with immediate effect and that they all have to go their own way. In the big, broad-leafed forest, a couple of wrens have built their nest in the stump of a beech tree.
in the same neighbourhood as the ravens. The young ravens to me already look as if they are all grown. At least they are as big as their parents. They just can't fly yet, but for that reason they are vigorously training their wings. But suddenly a drama happens over their heads. A raven has spotted a bird of prey that is coming worryingly close to the young birds, so he tries to chase it away. The young birds apparently sense the danger and stay still. The intruder soon withdraws and I am relieved. Immediately, the young ravens are active again. For them, it is high time to start flying, because it's slowly getting cramped in the nest. Now the two ravens are watching the breeding area from the air. Together, they are stronger against any attackers. Because they know very well that young birds, unable to fly, are a welcome addition to the menu of any predator. Even the forest acrobats, the squirrels, have enemies, especially during the day. They have to be permanently prepared for a hawk to attack without warning at any time. Even if the oak buds are oh so tasty, if you hang in plain sight from a tree trunk, you'll quickly become easy prey. Being careful is essential. In mid-May, the great spotted woodpeckers are busy from morning till evening with the search for food. I come across them everywhere in the forest. Hectically, they look for everything they can find in the old tree trunks. Every year, I'm amazed by the differences in nesting holes. While this old bird has to slip all the way into the nesting hole in this old birch tree, his woodpecker neighbour is greeted by the protruding beaks of its young. But wait, what do I see there? Obviously the young are bigger than I thought. Even the offspring of the great spotted woodpecker that was just chased off by a nut hatch are so grown that they can be fed from outside the hole. I only just discovered this hidden woodpecker nesting hole a couple of weeks ago. I arrive at the right moment. As if I guess that I'll get to see something special, I save this woodpecker hole till last. The young great spotted woodpecker shrieks incessantly and his parents tirelessly bring him food. Then suddenly a break. The amount of the next feed has been reduced. And the next time, there is no food.
I can imagine what this means. The parents are signalling, all clear for lift-off. All is well out here, come on out. As a reward, maybe even for reassurance, there is food given as soon as the youngster is outside. Following these exciting observations, another quick look at what the ravens are doing. They are still exercising their muscles. Sadly, the beech tree trunk still limits my view, so that I still don't know exactly how many young are in the nest. I guess there are five, but I'm not sure. On the forest lawn, I see a raven collect food it has hidden there. That is surely for its offspring. For the first time in weeks, I see a parent bird at the nest. And also, he flies in to feed the young. Ravens react sensitively to even the smallest disturbance. I stand perfectly still behind the tree and watch them. Already the partner approaches with food. Afterwards, all is quiet again. In the late afternoon, another fantastic surprise. At the same place as I did in the winter, I discover the wild cats. Surely their hiding place must be under the old tree trunk. Can I risk a careful peek from the side? I attempt it. The cat is restless. I hope not because of me. Wild cats look a lot like our domestic cats, but they are proper wild animals and not feral pets. Grown animals usually have a strong stature and they are easily recognised by the black rings on their bushy tails. And in comparison to house cats, they are extremely shy. What I didn't dare believe I see right in front of me, a wild cat kitten right next to the mother. I can't believe my luck. Late afternoon, shortly before I go home, a surprise discovery that reminds me of my childhood. How many years has it been since I last saw a cockchafer or may beetle? During the day, little insects hide under the leaves. They become active towards evening when they slowly crawl, as if in slow motion, up a beech leaf.
They also avoid rushing when eating. Even their chewing action is thoughtful and deliberate. But should male and female beetle encounter one another, then slow is a thing of the past. All of a sudden, they are in a hurry, because now it's about procreation, and they have got to get a move on. The beetles only live for a short time in the trees, and then only to breed. On the other hand, they spend many years on the forest floor as grubs. That is where the female returns towards the end of her life, in order to lay eggs to ensure the next generation. I was able to see exciting and interesting things today. It was a fulfilled first day of May in the forest, which I end as the sun dips under the horizon. On my next visit, the weather in the morning is anything but spring-like. It is wet and cold, grey and cloudy. A big rain front is moving over the country, which reminds me of the old farmer's adage, cool and wet in May fills the farmer's barn and barrel, they say. At least the red slug seems to be happy about the rain. November fog in mid-May. But before lunch, the grey veils lift. The sun occasionally shines through the clouds and it begins to dry. My first call is the ravens and their nest, just in time for a premiere. Under the watchful eye of the parents, the young ravens risk a first flying manoeuvre. The landing is still a bit shaky, but it all went well. The other one nearly took off, but then did it lose courage at the last minute? Does it want to go back into the safe nest? Made it. Carefully, I retreat, relieved by the successful return to the nest. In the thick undergrowth, not far from the meadow, I discover my first fawn of the year. It is lying absolutely still, perfectly camouflaged by its brown fur with light spots. Mother Nature has arranged it that fawns don't give off any body odour so that they won't be found by foxes. Have those little ears heard something? Maybe a little call from the mother who is not far off in the long grass. A last quick look and then I leave the fawn. Over the spruce forest, a buzzard is circling majestically. I realise there is a mouse in his claws, which he'll be taking to his offspring in a while. Two youngsters are in the nest. In early June, when they all be a little bigger, I'll come back. About now, the young roebuck loses his winter fur. 
I can see his summer coat around his head and shoulders. His antlers are still covered in velvet. Is he a late starter? He takes a break, surely to chew the cud. I can't rest. I head back to the ravens. Last year, at about this time, they flew for the first time. And this time, I don't want to miss it. This is what I feared. All of the young birds are standing outside the nest. Am I too late? No, one is still in the nest. I arrive just in time for his departure. Which, despite a rough encounter with a tree, ends without harm. Is he the last? Nothing can hold him now. The urge to fly out into freedom is stronger than any fear. Now all the young ravens have flown. Soon they will be circling over the forest together with their parents. My first deer this year with its shiny red summer coat. Carefully, it watches the goings-on at the edge of the forest. The deer eating here obviously reacts nervously to the approaching stag, which, despite its manly image in late May, is of little real interest to the female of the species. For these animals, the mating season isn't until July. Then it would be unthinkable for two roebucks to be standing peacefully side by side without fighting. But at the moment there is peace, togetherness, and for me it's an absolute idyll. In May there is always something to hear in the forest. Like so often, this is a coincidental observation that cannot be repeated next year. Because the middle spotted woodpecker finds a new home every year. I arrive just in time to surprise the woodpeckers while feeding. It's not so long ago that I couldn't tell the difference between the great and middle spotted woodpecker. Today I recognise the middle spotted woodpecker by its red head markings and its pink feathers around the midriff. Where the thin spruce trees push through the tops of beeches and oaks is where my secret favourites are at home.
I could watch the squirrels for hours. From my previous observations, I know that squirrels prefer certain paths, which they use time and again. This makes watching them easier. Did I startle it? Or was it running away from another squirrel? A small movement in the tree makes me curious. Might that be where their nest, the dre is, where the youngsters are reared? Or is it merely one of many temporary quarters that they like to create? That should be a mate, which would belong to a nest. The squirrel is agitated, but why? The territories have been established ages ago. Occasionally there are skirmishes and disagreements with neighbours, but only if they cross the boundaries. And the squirrel went off ages ago. For me, watching the squirrels is always exciting, regardless of what they are up to. And I am aware that these experiences are always short-lived. I nearly forgot to check on the family of black woodpeckers to see if the young birds are looking out of the nesting hole yet. I see that the offspring are already fairly big, so it won't be long before they leave the nest. But at the moment, the parents are still tirelessly bringing food. With growing impatience, the young birds wait for the next feeding and they are becoming increasingly aggressive towards their siblings. And then, suddenly, the time has come. The first young bird gets ready to fly off. For a short time, calm returns, but only until another young bird pushes towards the exit hatch. Inconspicuous in comparison is the behaviour of the young in the carefully hidden nest of the blackbird. A hundred years ago, the blackbird was a shy forest bird until it found its way into the parks and gardens to become a garden variety bird. But in the forest, blackbirds are still shy like their ancestors, so you need a lot of luck to spot a nest with chicks. I had that good fortune today. It was another fantastic day for me in the forest.
Thousands of dewdrops shimmer in the light of the rising sun on this June morning. An atmosphere that I particularly love. Even if getting up this early is a little difficult, I'm usually generously rewarded by wonderful sights. Shortly after sunrise, in the prettiest of morning light, a fox crosses the forest meadow right in front of me. No, he can't see me because I'm sitting well hidden on the edge of the forest and the wind is in my favour so he can't sense me. That must be a mouse. There is a rustling again. Master Reynard is getting a little too hot under his fur, so he gradually retreats to the cool of the forest. Here, all alone and without her parents, the fawn is looking for edible treats. What will it do if the fox happens to pass by? All I can do is hope that everything will be all right and that the fawn won't be harmed. Further into the forest where the sunlight shines between the trees and where shrubs and high grasses grow. A robin with food in its beak. It's made its nest under a tuft of grass. The chicks are already fairly big and will surely fly off soon but now they are patiently waiting for the next feeding. The robin suspiciously watches the area. Has he spotted me? The doe with her two fawns also leaves the forest meadow early. The forest provides her and her offspring better protection and anyway it's also not so warm there. Carefully I stalk back and forth between the forest meadow and the forest. The young song thrushes already have similar plumage to the adult birds a sign that they'll soon be leaving the nest. As long as they are in the nest, the parent birds take away their excrement in the form of small balls of faeces, which sometimes they even eat. Sounds disgusting, but it isn't, as these faeces balls contain valuable proteins, a perfect use of resources, and this way the birds keep the nest clean too. Behind me, there is a suspicious rustle. A wild boar, and what a magnificent animal. And not just one, but a whole group or sounder. It makes me feel a little uneasy.
They also have their piglets with them. I hope this goes well. This was the most dangerous situation I've experienced whilst watching animals in the forest. Because if we come too close to one another, then it could be unpleasant for me. In all the excitement, I nearly missed what was happening in the song thrush's nest. The sudden flight of the young bird caught not only me by surprise, but also its siblings are watching it in awe. A safe landing after about 20 metres of a first flight. Not bad for a little fellow. By now the two buzzards should be growing nicely. But with these birds of prey, not all the young develop at the same rate, which has to do with the different start to the mating season. While this nestling is busy training his wing muscles, these two young buzzards are still being fed by their parents. The siblings also didn't hatch at the same time, hence the visible difference in size. Small and unassuming, the common tree creeper. His plumage gives him perfect camouflage and his idiosyncratic way of moving makes him nearly invisible. Even a common bird like the chaffinch hides its nest so well that it takes great effort to find it. What I also notice, the male has a more colourful and colour-intensive plumage than the female. But that the males are more colourful than the females is common in many birds. On my walks through the forest, I like to rummage around old tree stumps. Over the years, I've made some interesting discoveries. And now, I also encounter something special. Just at this moment, a stag beetle is leaving his underground nest, in which he spent many years as a larvae, to spend a short time as a beetle in the forest. For me, a minor sensation. Many things happening at once, I have to decide. Out on the forest meadow, a vixen is taking her young out for the first time. Did she see me or why is she so nervous? Is that the reason, a strange fox? Now she has spotted me after all. For seconds she just stares at me. Before retreating, and clever as foxes are, she checks that no one is following. Then they are all gone. Before the day is over I want to try my luck with the deer, the biggest inhabitants of the forest. At last, after years of waiting, I manage a peek into the nursery of the kings of the forest.
For the first time I see the nursery, which is guarded with great care by the mothers and aunts. And a few more fawns join. So this is Bambi, the legendary fawn. How pretty the fur is with the pale markings of a fawn. And I'm sitting bang in the middle, simply indescribable. I want to enjoy this magical sight for as long as possible and relish this warm summer's evening. For me, this is experiencing nature. These are the moments in the forest of which I dream in the winter. A gentle evening breeze, sadly from the wrong direction, ends my adventure earlier than I had hoped. The extraordinary observations of the last forest visits give me the courage for a small experiment. On my next forest walk, I'll take along my son. Maybe I'll manage to excite him about nature. The success will depend on how eventful our day in the forest is. Of course, I have to prepare accordingly to avoid boredom. Sometimes coincidence comes to my aid, and suddenly for a boy of the Game Boy and PlayStation era, a find like this is of greater interest. I have also always dreamt of this, side by side with my adolescent son walking through the forest, discovering marvellous things, exploring the secrets of the forest together. Maybe I'll succeed in passing on this passion and that he too will be crazy about nature. My hope grows. On the forest meadow, two adult male mouflon or wild sheep are grazing, a picture which makes my heart beat harder. Will this fascinate my son too? I can't offer him any more adventure, so now it's up to him to decide. The rest of the summer I am on my own again, in my forest full of secrets. With every passing year, I increasingly enjoy the peace, the smell and the colours of the forest. It is still summer, but I can already see the first signs of autumn. As long as I can remember, I have wanted to spend every free moment out in nature, and hopefully that will stay unchanged. For me, it is the most beautiful forest in the world, and it still harbours many secrets.
Even if it doesn't have elves, fairies and dwarves, for me it is an enchanted forest. My wish to discover new and mysterious things while at the same time enjoying the inexhaustible beauty of the forest is easy to fulfill. I don't have to travel far. My path into the wood is right outside my front door. And as long as I respect the laws of nature and do not disturb the forest or its beasts, I can continue to uncover those secrets of the forest. Mm -hmm.